Well, good afternoon. Ambassador Young, Ambassador Shin, distinguished guests and panel members, faculty and students here and online, thanks for attending the first Cultural and Area Studies panel of the academic year. For those that are unaware, the CASA works with multiple partner organizations to identify important topics in support of U.S. national security and national defense strategy objectives across the spectrum of conflict. These discussions broaden our understanding of diverse and complex social and geopolitical current events affecting the world. The topic today is U.S. foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific area responsibility. I'm excited to hear and participate in today's discussion with our distinguished panel members, which includes, as well, our two ambassadors with the tremendous experience, insight, and perspectives from the highest levels of government, but also joined by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Mostafa, a terrific CGSE instructor from the Australian Army, and, and Dr. David Hunter Chester, a senior research analyst from TRADOC G2. So my challenge to those in attendance today is use this venue to expand your intellectual boundaries, create dialogue, and momentarily dive deeper into today's area of focus. So thanks again for your attendance and participation. I greatly look forward to hearing your thoughts and perspectives. And without further ado, I'd like to return the floor over to Dr. I for today's session, Educate to Win. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your support. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, for joining us today for our next CASO session. At the U.S. Army Cultural and Area Studies Office, CASO, Command and General Staff College, we love what we do, and we continue doing what we love. It gives us a real professional satisfaction and passion in support of your missions. With that sense in mind, we passionately continue closely following the regional and global geopolitics, which is really a chess game, which requires knowledge and wisdom. If you play it skillfully, you checkmate your adversary and prevail in support of your national security objectives. It's never black and white and always requires a flexibility in your options to explore. As the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who was born in 540 BC said, quote, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he is not the same man, end of quote. The same applies to geopolitics. It's fluid and constantly evolving. Philosopher Heraclitus was a wise man. I remember him quite well back then. So, to my point earlier, that's why the policy planners need to be flexible and adaptable to it based on analysis and real facts. That's very important. Per current operational environment, today's topic is clearly one of the priorities of our national security because the United States and its allies continue to be challenged in this strategically important region. Next slide, please. Just to remind our audiences, Quad, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue is an informal strategic forum consisting of the United States, India, Australia, and Japan. Right? I can, it's only for reading, so I cannot see without, uh, with this and India. <laughs> so um, it is essentially a platform 
to discuss regional and security issues, defense cooperation, and common challenges in the Indo-Pacific region, which originates from the devastating 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, when the four countries formed the so-called Tsunami Core Group, and it evolved since then. As usual, I would like to remind that the opinions and discussion points during the session are those of the speakers and the moderator and do not necessarily represent official positions of the United States government and partner, or partner organization governments. Complete bias of the panel and the moderator can be accessed on CASO website and we will go through those links in the end. Next slide, please. With this, I would like to yield the floor to Ambassador Stephen Young, who will discuss the US foreign policy and the role of Quad. Ambassador Young, the floor is yours. Would you let me just oh, sit down. OK. But it's up to you. How do I turn on the microphone? Rub, rub it? Hello. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, Ibrahimov. It's really nice to, to be back here. Um, I'm an Army brat, and uh, my dad served twice here, uh, first when he was a lieutenant colonel in the 60s, and then after uh, two tours in Vietnam, he... Um, chose as his last assignment to come back here so I could finish high school at uh, Leavenworth High School, uh, something I've always been grateful for because my older brother, like a true uh, army brat, went to four different high schools in three countries. <laughs> and he's been screwed up ever since. <laughs> Sorry, Jamie, I had to get that in. Um, it's a great honor to be here and and it's a very interesting topic uh, my background is really uh, Russia China uh, but uh, Indo-Pacific uh, spills over into all that and I'm going to try and give you a few quick thoughts uh, I have to laugh at uh, as I watch Beijing's uh, aggressive policies uh, driving most of Asia against them um, Arguably, Beijing's only two friends uh, today are beleaguered Russia and totalitarian North Korea. Uh, President Xi Jinping has uh, alienated the rest of Asia and brought U.S. power projection ever closer to containing the People's Republic. This during the pre-Nixon era uh, of the 1950s and 60s. The focal point currently is to is Taiwan, or as they call themselves, the Republic of China, the subject of US protection until the rise of China and uh, Kissinger's diplomacy began the steady isolation of that island nation in the 1970s. Alas, China has, if anything, become ever more authoritarian at home and belligerent abroad, despite the theory that countries as they prosper will become a little bit more open. Take a look at the map and you'll find that every other one of, uh, that other than Putin's increasingly authoritarian rule in Russia and Kim Jong-un's sorry state, Mr. Xi doesn't have any friends or allies to speak of. Even fence sitters like Mongolia, India, and even Vietnam, where the United States waged a long and ultimately um, uh, unsuccessful war some decades ago, are aligned now with the anti-China sentiments and a determination to curb China's aggression. I think if our, leader, our, our leaders in the 60s had done their homework, this might not have uh, brought the United States military power to the long and tragic war with Hanoi that cost over 50,000 US casualties and significantly uh, damaged uh, around the world to our diplomacy. I speak as 
someone whose father and brother fought in that conflict, thankfully coming home safely. My dad actually was a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, so uh, he certainly served his country well. But he was proud of me for the path I took. Uh, my wife, Barbara, who is here in the audience, and I visited both North and South Vietnam some years ago. We were surprised by the friendly welcome we received both in Hanoi and in the city to the south that now most residents still call Saigon, although the official name is Ho Chi Minh City. Even the museums we visited in Hanoi and especially in Saigon showed a, a fondness for America and a subtle suspicion of China and its uh, uh, authoritarian leaders. The Quad is still a work in progress, but all signs are that the Australian, New Zealand, US, and Japan are determined to counter Chinese territorial aggression. Mr. Xi has expressed his ambition to settle the Taiwan issue in his lifetime. And in that uh, connection, uh, he wants to, sur to, 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 to emulate Mao Zedong, who held on to power for the rest of his life. Elections in the United States for the presidency are always vigorous and hardly fought. But to my mind, if the contest is between Mr. Trump, who has uh, evinced a bizarre uh, attraction to authoritarian nations, and Joe Biden, despite chatter about his age, it's no contest. Meanwhile, the quad keeps getting stronger. Even the Philippines, which under uh, Marco dabbled with warmer ties with Beijing, has hardened its stance. Beijing's outlandish claims to territories from Taiwan to the South China Sea and India has only further alienated the rest of Asia. While the future is always difficult to predict, I harbor a solid conviction that the forces of cooperation and friendship and solid resistance to authoritarian opponents will continue and also define our diplomatic and political stance in the region. That's all I have to say now, but I really do look forward to uh, the, the, the conversation and the Q&A that will follow. Excellent, this is a great, uh, great presentation. Uh, thank Ambassador for very insightful information and analysis. It's going to get more and more interesting as we move forward. So you will see that later as well. So uh, next slide, please. The next speaker is Ambassador David Sheehan, who will tackle the US national security and China's challenge in the Indian Ocean. The ambassador will discuss the challenges China poses for US security, economic, and political interests in the region. Ambassador Shin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rai. More than 50% of global shipping and 70% of global oil shipments pass through the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is the maritime highway for China's raw material and energy requirements, including all of its imports and exports that pass through the Suez Canal and the Malacca Strait. China is also the leading trade partner for most of the countries that border the Indian Ocean. It is the top import partner for 24 of them and top export partner for 13. One of China's stated security priorities is to secure the sea lines of communications, or SLOCs, across the Indian Ocean. Since 2008, China has been deploying an anti-piracy task force in the Gulf of Aden, usually consisting of two frigates and a supply ship. Since 2013, China has routinely sent plan submarines into the Indian Ocean. To help secure the Indian Ocean slocks, in 2017, China established a naval base at Djibouti that can accommodate its largest ships. The PLA's Strategic Support Force has space 
tracking operations in Pakistan and Kenya. Since 2019, China has deployed a fleet of underwater drones to the Indian Ocean to collect naval intelligence. Although the, interrupted by COVID-19, the China significantly increased uh, port uh, calls, which resumed this year. China has stepped up naval exercises in the region, including trilateral exercises with Iran and Russia, most recently in the Gulf of Oman in March of 2023. The Chinese satellite tracking and missile telemetry ship calls at ports in the Indian Ocean, this year in South Africa and Sri Lanka. China will almost certainly deploy one of its aircraft carriers to the Indian Ocean within the next five years. China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has a heavy focus on infrastructure development, has become the centerpiece of its economic activity in the region. China recently supplemented the Belt and Road Initiative with the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative, both of which seek to bring the Global South closer to China and to encourage them to accept new international norms defined by China, replacing the traditional norms inspired by Western <coughs> countries. While China's naval presence in the Indian Ocean remains modest, its economic and political influence in littoral countries and island nations is significant and growing. China is the only country in the world that has an embassy in every Indian Ocean littoral nation and island country. China has engaged in a massive port financing, construction, management, and even equity investment in Indian Ocean ports. China promotes its security policies and strategies in a wide variety of international organizations, including the 23-member Indian Ocean Rim Association. The U.S. still has the strongest naval presence in the Indian Ocean uh, today, but increasingly it's being challenged by China. The U.S. military presence is focused in the Persian Gulf, in Djibouti near the Bab el Mandeb Strait, and in Australia. But it is also has a major facility in the middle of the Indian Ocean at Diego Garcia. The United States has divided military responsibility for the Indian Ocean among three commands, the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, the U.S. Central Command, and the U.S. Africa Command. This is not an ideal division of labor, but there's no obvious way to divide geographic responsibility among three commands. Nevertheless, a large portion of the Indian Ocean is not included in the strategy of the Indo-Pacific Command. There is no recent government strategy paper that deals holistically with the Indian Ocean. The State Department further complicates the situation by dividing responsibility for the Indian Ocean region among four geographical bureaus. These divisions by the Defense and State Departments result in bureaucratic stovepiping uh, of the Indian Ocean region by both of these uh, government departments. Alliances like the Quad and AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom, and U.S., are key components of U.S. policy in the region and aimed at containing China's rise in the Indian Ocean and Pacific. India's concern about growing Chinese influence in the Indian Ocean and New Delhi's closer ties with the United States are among the most important factors shaping security in the region. India is setting up new naval facilities in the eastern Indian Ocean in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, not far from the Malacca Strait. India has constructed a 3,000 meter runway on the island of Alalega, owned by Mauritius, which allows New Delhi to operate marine patrol craft. 
It has obtained logistics access to Japan's naval facility in Djibouti in the western Indian Ocean. Other U.S. allies, such as France, also have important interests and possessions in the Indian Ocean, uh, particularly the islands of Réunion and Mayotte uh, being uh, by far the most important. I look forward to uh, your questions on anything to do with the Indian Ocean element of this and the, the uh, eastern, uh, uh, the, rather the, the western side of Africa, the eastern side of Africa. And I turn the program back to Dr. I. Thank you, Ambassador, for very interesting perspective. Next slide, please. Our next speaker is Lieutenant Colonel Paul Mustafa, who will provide his analysis and overview of the recently released Australian Defense Strategic, Strategic Review, correct? and what some of the key developments are for the region with focus on the Quad members. Obviously, this is the Australian partner perspective. Colonel, uh, Colonel Mustafa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. I. Um, so I think it's useful when we, when we think about addressing geopolitics, it, it can be tempting sometimes to think as geography is kind of the stable component of that word and, and politics is the changing dynamic. Um, However, maps can be looked at in very different ways, uh, and each nation's unique geography really drives their perspective of the world and how they view the strategic security environment. Um, so if we could start with the first slide. So th this, is, this is kind of the, the typical map that you would expect to see when you, when you seek out a map of the world. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, here's another way of viewing it with America kind of at the centre. Um, some would say that's how America views itself. Uh, others would say potentially that's how the rest of the world views America. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, um, so here's another way of looking at it. So we've now flipped. So the global south is up the top. Um, and, and this is just a, a really simple way of kind of interrupting some of the heuristics that we use to make sense of things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's potentially worth looking at this and thinking about were this the way that the map was presented all the time would we view the world somewhat differently to the way that we do? Um, I did make the mistake in preparing for this brief in asking Google how the world sees Australia. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, yep. <laughs> somewhat unhelpful for the conversation we're having today. Uh, but if we move on to the last one, please. So um, what we have here is, is, is a different orientation of, of Australia in its position. And you can see essentially a, a relatively land-based bridge that moves from Australia all the way over to India. Um, what that helps us do in, in many ways is kind of break out of that mindset that Australia is a, a, an island nation that's predominantly focused on maritime and air domains as threats in, in the traditional three domain mindset. Um, and with that context, what I'll do is, is use this to kind of focus the rest of my comments um, on the recent updates uh, to Australia's view of uh, and role in the regional strategic context, uh, regional strategic environment, sorry. Um, so the 24th of April this year, um, the Australian government released the public version of the uh, classified defence strategic review. Um, so the defence strategic review itself was a uh, independent review um, headed up by Sir Angus Houston, who's a uh, retired Chief of Defence Force, uh, and uh, the Honourable Stephen Smith, who was a previous uh, Australian um, Minister for Defence, or sorry, correction, Secretary for Defence. Um, importantly, the Defence Strategic Review was not a strategy. Um, it is a holistic consideration of the Australian Defence Force's structure, posture, uh, and also inclusive of the force disposition that we have, the preparedness, uh, strategy and associated investments to that. Um, in introducing that uh, version of the report, um, Defence Minister, the current Defence Minister, Richard Miles, noted that, and, and I'll read this, a large-scale conventional and non-conventional military build-up without strategic reassurance is contributing to the most challenging circumstances in our region for decades. This is combined with rising tensions and reduced warning time for conflict. The risks of military escalation or miscalculation are rising. So I want to put this in the context of, of prior to 2020, of, uh, sorry, 2020, uh, which was when the most recent 
government release document came out around our national strategy, which was the defence strategic update. Um, prior to that point, Australia had been working under the assumption of a 10-year strategic warning time for any kind of major uh, conventional attack against Australia. Um, so the defence strategic update in 2020 essentially said that this is no longer a valid assumption. So that 10-year warning time we had been using was no longer valid. Um, one of the key judgments that came out of the Defence Strategic Review uh, was that the Australian Defence Force was no longer fit for purpose um, and that we needed a much faster schedule for our force generation, uh, particularly including procurement. And I, I, I think that observation kind of echoes uh, very much some of the current debates that are going on throughout European NATO as well. Um, we need to abandon our pursuit of perfect solutions um, or processes and then focus on delivering timely and relevant capability, right? We need to move away from this process of letting great be the enemy of good. Um, the, the review itself identified six priority areas uh, for immediate action, um, those being the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines through AUKUS, focused on our deterrence capabilities, uh, developing the Australian Defence Force's ability to precisely strike targets at long range, and also manufacture munitions to support that within Australia. Uh, improve our ability to operate from our northern bases. Uh, initiatives to improve the growth and retention of a highly skilled defence workforce. Lift our capacity to rapidly translate disruptive new technologies into ADF capability in close partnership with Australian industry. And lastly, to deepen our diplomatic and defence partnerships with key partners in the Indo-Pacific. So as the government seeks to essentially translate the outcomes from this review into our strategy, uh, one of the key focal areas, certainly in the discussion that's going on back home, um, and, and hopefully obvious to most of you, is, is budget, right? Um, one could pick from a very, very long list of quotes from many international theorists and practitioners about uh, strategy not being a strategy if it's not funded. Um, I'll just stick with uh, our Defence Minister again, Richard Miles, who said strategy without money is just hot air. So that's coming from the Defence Minister. Um, the Defence Minister also observed that uh, Australia's budget since, since our Federation really has, has, been, has been focused on essentially a, a, a very binary approach, right? war or peace. So when we're in war, we invest in our military, spending goes up, and when we're in peace, we diffuse that money out to other areas of uh, national importance because we're seeking those peace dividends. Um, that, that is not the world we are in now. So the grey zone is, is much bigger and getting bigger uh, and it's essentially the end of that binary divide of we can spend money when we need to in war and save money when we need to in peace. Um, importantly, I think with the Defence Strategic Review, it's essentially calling for an approach where um, capability drives our budget conversations rather than our budget driving our capability conversations. Uh, the review itself also included, imp very importantly I think, a, a, a full chapter on the need for a whole of government, whole of nation approach um, and explicitly uh, recommends appropriate resourcing for our defence, uh, correction, our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, so our State Department equivalent, um, to lead that role. Um, to me, uh, what, what, what that approach is saying is we're essentially trying to complement this idea that the Quad needs to be seen as something more than just an anti-China grouping. Um, and, and, and I think that's reflected in a, in a comment very recently from the Indian Prime Minister uh, Modi, who said the Quad needs to stand for something, not just against something. Um, specifically for the Australian Defence Force, uh, the review calls for a shift from a balanced force to a focused and more integrated force. Um, so I'll, I'll dive down to the army level because I'm, I'm an army guy. Uh, so, so what we're seeing there is a move away from um, some of the significant investments we had uh, slated to make in armoured vehicles, for example. Uh, and some examples of that are uh, a, a very large reduction in the numbers of infantry fighting vehicles that we're purchasing. So we were, we had a project in play for 450. That number has been reduced down to 129. Um, and also cancellation of a, uh, a second tranche of uh, self-propelled artillery being purchased. Um, so 
30 self-propelled guns with the associated resupply vehicles has been removed. Um, that shift of financing, though, has gone now towards the procurement of uh, long-range fires and littoral manoeuvre vessels, primarily medium and heavy uh, landing craft. So as you look up at that slide, you can see the utility of those platforms far more than uh, a significant investment in heavy armoured vehicles. Um, we're quite fortunate in so far as we've had some uh, pretty significant investments previously in protected mobility vehicles. So the protection aspect of it is still there, but we need to be able to move around and operate in our region. Um, I would be remiss not to address AUKUS. Uh, and, and I think one of the really important things that I would highlight with AUKUS is that this is a trilateral security partnership between Australia, the US and UK. It is not a mutual defence treaty. So very often the, the terms get conflated. Um, that is not what AUKUS is. AUKUS is essentially a two-pillar program. So pillar one being the uh, acquisition and development of conventionally armed, conventionally armed, nuclear-powered submarines for the Australian Navy. That is the most significant investment in defence that Australia has made since its founding. So we are talking about a budget of between 268 and 368 billion Australian dollars. So to put in context, our annual budget, I think this year was around the 50 billion mark, um, over the next 30 years to procure those platforms. Um, pillar two of AUKUS, which unfortunately doesn't get as much um, attention, is essentially a collaboration on advanced capabilities in, in, the, in the technology and information sharing space. So here we're talking about um, boosting development of uh, robotics, autonomous underwater vehicles, quantum technology, artificial intelligence, advanced cyber, hypersonics, electronic warfare. So taking these asymmetrical advantage items and then coming at them from a far more uh, collaborative approach than it would be if we tried to steam pipe or stove pipe those capability developments internally. I think for me, as I look at the DSR, um, and so this is me talking now, right? Uh, this is really about building complementary capabilities that service our national interests, but also enhance the utility with regional partners and allies. The as you, as you look across that region, you can see that uh, many of the armies in that region, or sorry, many of the nations in that region focus their defence spending on armies. I think it's important to understand that if you only have a little bit of money to spend on defence, army is, is an easy place to put it, right? Armies are relatively cheap. So as we think about the development of capabilities across the region for the more wealthy countries, what is it that we can bring that gives us that unique competitive advantage to be the partner of choice? And those are those capabilities that the other nations in that area cannot afford. Um, and, and for me, I think that's the approach that a lot of the, that, that we're taking as allies. Um, the last thing I'd say, because I have spoken about the multinational piece, uh, if you would like to get a much better appreciation of some of the multinational operation challenges, uh, there will be another panel in this room on the 25th of September from 12.30 to 13.30, where we will do a deep dive into those. Thank you, Dr. I, back to you. Thank you, Colonel, for a very informative presentation. Next slide, please. So everybody's doing well so far? It's going to be get more interesting. Please stay with us, okay? So it's going to be not just interesting, going to be fascinating. All right. At this time, Dr. David Hunterchester will provide his analysis and will discuss Japan's perspective in the rapidly changing geopolitical and security environment of the region, another great topic. Dr. Hunterchester, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dr. I. So let's talk about Japan. After World War II, uh, America occupied Japan and we rewrote their constitution, forbidding them from maintaining armed forces or waging war. The Japanese, during the negotiations uh, for that constitution, managed to change the wording of that article, the War Renunciation Clause, Article 9, to allow for an interpretation that Japan could have forces for self-defense. 1947, we began to negotiate 
defense and peace treaties with Japan to end the occupation. Their first prime minister under the new constitution, Yoshida, was not interested in rearming, which in that short amount of time, our policy had reversed. We wanted Japan now to rearm. And Yoshida said, nope, here's Article 9, we're not rearming. But we will allow Japan, <coughs> we will allow armed forces of America to be hosted here in Japan after the occupation ends. Uh, so his policy was to uh, push back against any attempt we were uh, to rearm, and we were steadily pushing him uh, to rearm. And his policy won the day and became known as the Yoshida Doctrine incremental, minimal rearming with a focus on economic development for Japan. While Japan was still occupied in 1950, the Korean War broke out and MacArthur directed Japan to rearm to form a small 75,000 man army that was called a National Police Reserve because of Article 9, but everybody knew it was an army. After the occupation was over, the name changed. It became the Self-Defense Forces, the SDF. Uh, yeah, all right, so now we can get to the next, oh no, sorry. There's Abe Shinzo, is that uh, picture. Abe Shinzo was the longest serving prime minister in Japan's History. He's the grandson of another prime minister, Kishi Nobusuke, who was one of the few leaders in the 1950s that felt it was a national shame that Japan did not have normal armed forces, and he wanted to change that. So the first thing he wanted to change was the defense treaty from 1952, which was frankly a treaty with a, an army as if it were still occupying Japan. So he pushed for a more equal treaty, he squeezed it through the diet. And here's where you get to the point where Japan, though they have never been really pacifist, I mean, they've always had armed forces, either their own, their own and allied, or <coughs> just allied forces there. They've never been truly pacifist. But after the war, they developed a norm uh, known or coined by political scientist Andrew Oros as domestic anti-militarism. They did not trust their own historic military. And they saw any change to the minimally armed SDF status quo as a slippery slope back to the battle days of uh, military dictatorship. So there were often violent react, not often, but there were violent reactions to that. So they get a new mutual security treaty, which is actually a better deal for them but because it had to do with the military, they had the most violent and prolonged uh, demonstrations in post-war Japanese history. And a young Japanese uh, college student, a young woman, died. And that really sealed the fate, locked in the Yoshida Doctrine for the next several decades on into this uh, century. But Abe Shinzo grew up at Kishi's knee hearing that, you know, it's really a shame that Japan doesn't have its own uh, regular military, and he wanted to change that. When he came to office in 2007, he was one of the first international leaders to suggest this four-country grouping called the Quad. He hoped it would be a democratic security diamond. And when he came back to power in 2012, he urged a, a reinvigoration of the Quad. He also articulated a strategy supporting a free and open Indo-Pacific, which was later adopted by us. And he had the first national security strategy written for Japan and formed a national security Council for Japan, but he was unable to get Article 9 amended, which was his dearest wish. And unfortunately, after he was out of office last year, he was assassinated. Next slide. 
So we get to the current prime minister, uh, Kishida Fumio. He was considered a dove and a, he was a compromise candidate for this position, but he was in office when uh, Ukraine was invaded by Russia. And he's on record several times as saying that Taiwan could be the Ukraine of East Asia and a much more world destabilizing one at that. So he has pledged uh, to double Japan's percentage of GDP that they spend on defense. Since the 70s, they've had an informal but very important policy to them that it remain at 1%, but he says in four and a half years now, it'll be up to 2%. That's a 60% increase in the budget, and that'll make them the number three uh, largest budget in the world. He's also uh, pledged to reinvigorate the free and open Indo-Pacific policy and to strengthen and uh, <clears throat> support the Quad. All right, Japan's post-war domestic anti-militarism norm has driven Japan to pursue what they call comprehensive security with important economic and diplomatic dimensions. That's the kind of outlook that produced Abe's original vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, one that requires cooperation with like-minded democracies. The four countries of the Quad remain a cornerstone of that vision. All right, it was just a few minutes, but I've been studying Japan for 50 years, so I <laughs> look forward uh, to any questions that you may have. Dr. I. Thank you, Doctor, for very insightful information. And next slide, please. Now is the time for the most favored, engaging stage of our session, which is questions, answers, and comments. So um, we have, obviously, this room, Arnold Conference Room, and we have uh, multiple outstations, including overseas, our deployed units. So for some reason, I think uh, probably I've done something right, our panels are quite popular and our outstations also connect us through CJC Facebook Live regardless of the time difference. So whomever asks a question, we will begin with this room. Please introduce yourself, ask your question, and make a comment. Um, our public affairs office, Ms. Sarah Hauk, obviously will be able to read uh, the questions and comments via CJC Facebook Live to the panel, unless there is any specific reference to a particular panel member. So we'll try to go in order whomever would like to answer the question or reply to a comment. So, the discussion today is going to be in English. Not man Chinese Mandarin or, so if that's okay. <laughs> that's a little humor, but. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so this is with that, the floor is yours. But before doing that, before I forget, we have some complimentary copies of the book sponsored by Cultural Area Studies Office. We just received those uh, uh, extra copies. By the way, we've got a uh, great partnership with Army U Press, and we did the anthology, several anthologies with them. Uh, and the cast was contacted and spo sponsored, and uh, Colonel Mustafa was part of the, that effort as well. Uh, Dr. Bab was also part of anthology, one of the anthologies at least our China expert, and many others, our great uh, CJC scholars. So those are for you uh, up, uh, upon your uh, exit from the room. You are welcome to grab one. In addition to several books which we published with outside publishers, we're happy to share with you as well. Uh, with that, we will begin with this uh, room. Uh, who has a question or comment? Yes, sir, please introduce yourself, ask your question, and make a comment. So I'm Major Chi. Oh. 
Yes. By the way, if you sit in the back, this is the two microphones, okay? Because the microphones only on this rows. Okay. Nice to meet you, yes, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for the time. So I'm Major Chi uh, from CGSOC Staff Group Five Delta. Uh, my question is, how would you guys see a South Korea as a geopolitical code, as either imperative or elective? So my background uh, reasoning for that question is, so I see a two biggest difference and uh, scopes and the uh, the in the the problem with the uh, current agenda is that the. Uh, I know we see the China as a global concern, and then to me, the North Korea is more of kind of local problem. Uh, so meaning kind of more immediate uh, concern. So, so since Ch South Korea is kind of more relating to North Korea, and then in in one part of the Quad Plus country, and I just want to uh, hear from you guys and see, uh, you know, do you think that the uh, expanding the the Quad relationship to the other countries it would be necessary or? Is the current uh, for, uh, formation is, is good enough? Who would like to begin with the answer from the distinguished panel? Uh, all right, well, Dr. Uh, personally, I was uh, very happy to see that recently we had a uh, trilateral, uh, the US, Japan, and South Korea uh, Japan and South Korea have a long-standing uh, enmity. Uh, when it's clear to those who are outside of, of that area uh, that it's a single theater and to protect uh, one, you have to protect the other. So they should be working together. They, they're natural partners. Uh, and so I would say also that South Korea is a natural partner for uh, the Quad, but the Quad, as someone uh, mentioned earlier, is not a formal military alliance. It's a, uh, it's a security dialogue, and there have been some military exercises, uh, and it's a very valuable tool for communication, but it, it's not, uh, as China has uh, complained, a, a, an, an Asian NATO. So yes, uh, South Korea is important and uh, having South Korea work more closely with the Quad, with the Quad, <laughs> or, or with the Quad, I don't know, with the Quad, I think would be uh, a good idea. So I, th I think it comes back to um, one of the points I made earlier about um, how, how the Quad is viewed. So, so what is the purpose of it? Um, if it's viewed as being something that is just an anti-China relationship, then that, that's probably not helpful. Um, but if it's, if it's viewed as something more, as in, hey, we're, we're for positive developments within the region, because th there's a balancing act here, right? So you don't want to send the message that, hey, we're now starting to build greater and greater groupings of countries who are aligned against China, because that's, that's not what we're trying to do. Um, so as long as the transparency about what that organisation exists for is there, um, I... I I would encourage greater and greater participation um, from, from countries across the region, again, with that transparency view up front of, you know, this is for the betterment of the organisation, not as something that's just there as an anti-China hedge. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, any, is that answers your question, sir? Yes, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, anybody else uh, while the outstation still typing their long questions? So anybody else from this room? Who has the question or make a comment? Yes, sir, this is the mic, please. Good afternoon, Captain Ian Staley from CGSC Staff Group 15 Bravo. I think this is a good segue because my question was also kind of related to the quad and kind of the role. So Ambassador Young mentioned the enmity that's arising between China and other nations in the area. And then Colonel Yusuf talked about, like, what does the Quad stand for? So, obviously, big strategy they can talk about, free and open Indo-Pacific, or specific um, objectives or ways might be the United Nations Convention of the Laws of the Sea, with China deciding to do things differently and say, hey, these are now our islands, and rewriting maps. Um, does that something the Quad could potentially get involved with and say is, one of those things they stand up for, and then what does the panel think on that? Thank you, sir. Who would like to begin with the answer? 
Yeah. Yes, Ambassador uh, uh, Young. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, uh, first of all, and uh, building on the co comments of my colleagues, I am greatly relieved that uh, the enmity between Japan and Korea is beginning to ease just a little bit. I, I like to think that there's a uh, retirement uh, age for, for, for such old quarrels, and I think the Japanese have shown themselves to be great partners. So uh, that's, that's something really important, particularly from my perspective as it relates to Taiwan, a place where I have uh, great and fond memories. Uh, it's interesting because having lived in Taiwan, despite being a colony of Japan's for 50 years, there's a lot of warmth toward Japan. They, they did it right. They, you know, later on with the Chinese and others, the, the, the Southeast Asians, they were much more brutal, but the, the Japanese remain respected there. And if you want to go to Taiwan and go to the National Palace Museum or other places, you'll see Japanese flocking there and then doing sightseeing because uh, uh, there's a, a reasonably good feeling between them uh, that is in sharp, sharp contrast from the uh, hostility that many of the Southeast Asians and others feel toward Japan. In fact. The Chinese have been uh, treating like 1945 was yesterday, which, you know, there's a statute of limitations, it seems to me, especially given the role that Japan can play in today's world. From the panel, please. Uh, yes, Colonel. Yeah, so I, I think it's important to also observe that there are, there are a lot of engagement forums that exist inside of the Indo-Pacific. Um, so ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that, that forum exists to do a lot of those things. So uh, economic development, security arrangements, et cetera. So as you think about introducing more uh, engagement forums into that environment, you then start to run into the challenge of, well, nations only have so much capacity to engage in that space, number one. Um, and number two, the, the more you increase the different forums, the more you, uh, you, you dilute the, uh, the, the effectiveness and the, and the oomph that comes with the existing ones that are there. So um, I, I think the Quad, uh, the, le the leaders of the nations of the Quad have been very clear about, you know, ASEAN first. ASEAN is, is the forum of note inside of that region for achieving a lot of those things. And, and, and that should be the focal point um, for resolving the kinds of issues that you're talking about. Anybody else from the panel? All right, is that answers your question, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you for the great question and thank you, panel, for the great answers. Sir, the, yes, please introduce you. This, this is the mic, it's up. Any of this? Gentlemen, I'm uh, Captain Ian McKnight from Staff Group 9 Charlie. I guess my question for the group is, what are the thoughts as we look at the map, what is the impact of Antarctica into the Indo-Pacific area, specifically with the Indian Ocean and then the Australians' view for their defense strategy as it potentially can become weaponized and not unilaterally a research area, sir. Is the question clear? Okay, who would like to begin? Colonel, please. Uh, so I, I, I think part of the challenge is how, how many you know what ifs contingencies do you do you look, do you think of and look at? So the Antarctic is not militarized. Um, there are arrangements in place that uh, the countries of that region have signed on to to agree that it is not going to be militarized. Um, you know, I guess you could ask the same question about the moon, right? Like, could the moon be militarized? Sure, it could. Um, but you know, how, how how much effort do you invest into? Uh, preparing for a, a, a military type intervention inside of that environment. Um, I mean, it, it comes down to balancing. So I think, I think the immediate threats that we are seeing um, or, or certainly the, the, the tensions that we're seeing emerging um, don't appear to be focused on that area. Um, and I would, my observation is that the, um, the, the strategic and operational approaches that the other countries in the region, including Australia, are taking is that 
Um, yes, we acknowledge that that's there, but it's it's not high up on the list of priorities, um, which is which is you know essentially how you have to go about doing business when you have uh, a world where your um, your ends or desires can be infinite, but your your means themselves are, are finite. Excellent, excellent discussion. Anybody else from the distinguished panel? Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, please. Introduce yourself, ask a question. Uh, my question is for uh, uh, Colonel Mostafa. Uh, the problem is this, that uh, you, you discussed the uh, fact that uh, Australia is trying to uh, build up the army that can um, basically cover the uh, region. Uh, we, we, we have an uh, economy, economy uh, geopolitics, uh, military, uh, and everything else. So based on this, uh, if uh, you are, you are, um, Australia considers itself as a regional superpower or regional power, uh, how can create the uh, defense line between the uh, South Indian, uh, South, uh, South Pacific and then the uh, North Pacific and areas that the China is uh, really uh, generate power? Yeah, so our, our approach to the defence of Australia historically has been a, a very much centric, you know, this is Australia, this is where we'll defend, and as long as we can manage the, the maritime and air approaches, then, then we should be okay. Um, we can have a small army that we use in support of alliance operations around the region, um, but really we're talking about air and maritime approaches. Um, I, think, I think the transition that we're starting to see now is, is we're taking more of a, a collective approach um, not just with our with our major allies, the, the US, um, and to you know, potentially a lesser degree uh, the UK, um, but but looking at the region as a more holistic um, area that we engage with, uh, and then as we do seek to develop capabilities internally to Australia, looking at those capabilities as I mentioned before as as complementary capabilities. So, how 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 can we invest our dollars to create an environment where um, we're not seen as being threatening to our neighbours, we're seen as being useful to our neighbours. Does that kind of answer the question? Uh, yes. Thank you. If I could just uh, follow up and, and reiterate a, a point that I uh, made in my opening remarks about the need to look at the Indian Ocean area holistically. I don't think anyone, quite frankly, is doing that. Uh, the United States is not doing it, as I tried to point out in in the maps that I showed, where we divide everything up uh, according to different geographic jurisdictions, and nobody is really looking at the Indian Ocean as a holistic piece of water. And I think this is, uh, is a mistake. It may also apply to uh, how you deal with Antarctica, for example. Um, it, it, that has to be almost be included in the discussion. But I think the time has come where somewhere in the U.S. government we need to look at a strategy that deals with the entire Indian Ocean region and not divide it up into one of the State Department's geographic bureaus or, or one of the uh, military's commands uh, because it uh, is increasingly becoming an area of interest uh, for China, among other countries. Uh, Excellent. Yes, it does please. strike me, uh, David, that uh, uh, PACOM is beginning to look more at the Indo-Pacific as one important region, and, and if that trend continues, it would be uh, along the lines that you suggested we need to do. The, I think I think PACOM is headed in that direction, but it has not gotten there. Um, and and even the the Indian Ocean part of it, the, the western side of the Indian Ocean, is not under PACOM's responsibility. Uh, if you look at the the PACOM strategy paper that came out in 2022. I think it mentions the Indian Ocean uh, twice in the, in the entire document. Uh, it does make mention of the need for close cooperation with India, which is a good thing. But PACOM, uh, looking at the strategy paper, seems to be looking still more towards the Pacific than towards the Indian Ocean area. Excellent. Is that a, yes, yes ma'am. Is that answer the question? Okay, yes. ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry. So you the next, and then you will be uh, after, uh, after this. So introduce yourself. And it's up. It's already up, sir. Yes, you are good. Mm -hmm. This will probably be my question. Well, first off, I'm Ray Barrett, uh, an old retired guy, uh, Army guy. Um, so that's who I'd be. 
question is Belton Road. Um, I've been hearing in the last year or so there's some backlash to it. Um, because of the uh, agreements that were penned some time ago before the major investments, there's the, the there's uh, the, the China is taking over, is getting equity in some of these uh, ports and bases, logistics stuff and so forth. About three years ago or so, I, uh, I live in Kansas City, I uh, hosted an officer coming to the school here from Djibouti. And I asked him, I said, why in the hell did you let China build a god dang base right there at the Baba El Mandab? I mean, you know, just didn't make much sense to me. He says, well, pretty simple, it was money. Okay, I got it. You know, I should have been smarter to, than to ask that question. But So the question, my, uh, I have two p pieces to the question. Is there, in fact, a backlash uh, growing through these uh, southern uh, hemisphere nations that have predominantly uh, in been engaged and have, enga uh, and have had negotiated with China, you know, leasing rights and buildings and so forth? Uh, and in that line, the move towards the South Pacific, the attempt uh, that uh, China has made with uh, I can't remember whether it was one of the Marshall or Micronesia or Solomon Islands, but one of the islands they have a, uh, an agreement supposedly for police assistance, but can easily be uh, moved on to military, naval, and of course nobody knows what's written in the small, small letters that's not necessarily published in those agreements. So it's about the Belt and Road, its current status. Uh, so Ambassador, I suspect since you're the one who raised it, you'd probably want to maybe answer the question, but, but yeah, I'd, others I'd be, can chime in. I'd be happy to, uh, to respond to that. Um, let me start with Djibouti, though. Uh, Djibouti has six military bases, uh, and I think they're all for the money. Uh, everyone's paying, and uh, well, yes, Djibouti, we know, Djibouti we is, a, well. I, including I, 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 the United States, which has a significant, significant base, uh, Camp uh, Lamonia at uh, Djibouti. Uh, but uh, Djibouti's out there looking for for cash, and uh, this is one way to get it. Uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative, you use the term backlash. Um, that may be a, a little bit strong of a term to use, but I think it's close to what is going on. It's, it's maybe something between uh, skepticism and backlash. Backlash may be a little bit too harsh in terms of where uh, a lot of countries are with the Belt and Road Initiative. But the, the Belt and Road Initiative was initially very popular. Um, well over 100 companies, uh, countries uh, signed uh, agreements with China for being part of the Belt and Road. Uh, almost uh, all of the countries in the Indian Ocean area did. They, uh, many of them benefited from it in that they received uh, loan, usually loans, for building infrastructure projects or some kind of project. A couple of problems have developed with it. One is that many of the countries, particularly in Africa, have developed too much uh, debt and are finding it's too difficult to pay it off. But China's also found that it doesn't really like to loan money if it's not going to be paid back. Uh, so they're a little concerned about the degree of uh, loans that they make to Belt and Road co countries. So you've got two things going on. The, uh, some of the recipients uh, deciding to pull back because they're, they just don't want more debt, and China wanting to limit the amount of loans that it offers because it doesn't want to extend more debt that will not be paid back. And as a result, the whole Belt and Road concept has become uh, somewhat weakened in the last several years, and that's why China has moved on to the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative which are emphasizing things other than a lot of new loans uh, that you used to see under the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but the Belt and Road is still uh, alive and well, but it's, um, it's being looked at with a more jaundiced eye uh, with each passing year. Anybody else from the panel, please? So I, I think as you, as you look at the Belt and Road, um, it's, it's important to acknowledge that countries are gonna act in their own national interest. Um, and I don't typically like to speak in absolutes, but I would say all countries act in their own national interests. Um, and in the absence, 
of any other source of investment funding, um, the, the Belt and Road is the choice, right? So I, I, wouldn't, I don't think that all of these countries are looking at China as the number one preferred partner of choice when it comes to infrastructure investment. Um, but up until relatively recently, there was not another option. Um, so with the, with the G7 coming together and announcing the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, you now have another forum that these countries can go to and look at to, to, to provide the function that the Belt and Road was essentially the, the, the only loan uh, operator on the street, for example. Um, and so I, I think that kind of ties in to the key message I was making before about, you know, it's not enough to, uh, you, you want a more positive view for the world, right? Um, so it's not enough to just wave your finger at some of these countries and say, don't, don't take that money from China, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good option for you if you're not going to offer them something else to use in that space. And, and I think that's what we're seeing now with the, with the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else from the panel? Please? Just adding, I think China, um, and I mentioned this earlier, has uh, through its very aggressive uh, policies around its periphery, um, at a minimum, put other neighbors on guard as to how deeply they get involved with China. Obviously, when there's money involved, there are uh, attractions. But uh, the fact that China has territorial disputes with virtually all of its neighbors uh, makes them a less than perfect partner for any deals. All right. Okay, yes, sir, please. Uh, that would probably be best to answer this question. Given the uh, ambassador's comment about the jaundice view within the uh, CCP uh, of, uh, of, of loans and extended loans that aren't getting repaid and so forth and what have you, is there somewhat of any, uh, is there any hint of a threat to Xi Jinping's uh, hold or, or position given that he ran, uh, he, he, he had the constitution Changed so that he could be, you know, premier for life. Much on the well, the Belt and Road, but the other two initiatives of 2025 and you know some other other things. So, does is there any internal risk uh, to him uh, that's beginning to, to, to bubble up? Okay. You know, I spent a lot of time looking at China, and it's very difficult to understand it. I do think that Xi Jinping, unlike Putin, has an economy that's not based on uh, export of raw materials. But um, it's a very brittle, uh, centristic system. And, and those of us who studied China know that there have been uh, many outliers, particularly around the periphery, who have great uh, skepticism about closer ties with China, especially because China uh, continues to make territorial claims on their borders. Uh, so I think, you know, China has uh, to change the tenor of their diplomacy if they're going to be able to get beyond first base in terms of cooperating with their neighbors. And uh, I don't see Xi Jinping willing to do that. I mean, like Putin, I think Xi Jinping has isolated him so, so much that he probably doesn't get good advice from his, you know, if uh, any of us who've been bosses know if you're not very, very open to people speaking up, they won't do it. And Xi Jinping, like Putin, doesn't encourage that. I have to say, I, Ray and I were, uh, our families were friends, what, 60 years ago, and uh, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, if my brother didn't date your sister, I think he was interested in dating your sister <laughs> way back then. <laughs> so Excellent. it's good to, good to see you. Excellent discussion, really fascinating. So anybody else on the panel? Good? 
Is that answers your question, sir? Ma'am, you are the next, please. <laughs> okay. Your question, comment, I'm sure it's going to be a great question. Please. We'll see. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, I'm a student here. My name is Major Natasha Marshall. You guys have been talking about the vying for economic control. We've been talking about alienation of China by some of their actions. We've also been talking about trying to or being happy with being closer with India um, and them being part of the Quad and that strengthening. How does BRICS come into play with this? Because it seems counterintuitive to me, but it seems like that's India posturing to be a foot on both sides of this struggle. Excellent, excellent. So who would like to begin with the answer? Anybody from the panel, please? Okay. Who is the first? Uh, Ambassador Shin, well, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as I understand it, the question is how did the BRICS come into this? Uh, yes, sir. Just what's the interpretation of India being part of BRICS, uh, the implications of that? No, I, I would just comment on it from the standpoint of, of the Indian Ocean area, uh, particularly, um, although there are others on the panel who would know the, um, the India China border situation much better than I do. Uh, which is, all, is a, probably an even more important component of it in, in the context of BRICS. As you, as I think most of you know, the BRICS are a five-member organization at the moment that are soon to uh, add another six or so members on the beginning of next year. Uh, when, you, when you look at uh, India and, um, and China in the context of the BRICS, uh, I basically see a big disconnect as I look at the Indian Ocean, they don't have anything in common uh, in the Indian Ocean. In fact, India uh, sees China as trying to encircle India uh, between the northern border on the one hand and Pakistan on, on another border uh, and the Indian Ocean and China's naval uh, expansion in the Indian Ocean. They see this as all a lot of bad news. So they can all get together in, in South Africa and have their most recent BRICS meeting and I guess have a good time and maybe talk about how they, they divide their money in the BRICS Development Bank, but I, I can't imagine what goes on behind the scenes uh, in, these, in these conversations. I, I just don't see it as, a, um, as, a, as really a meaningful organization in this context. And then you start adding in, as the BRICS are doing, countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, what do they have in common uh, when uh, you get right down to it? I, I see a lot of tension developing. To me, the BRICS is, uh, is, is in many respects sort of a, a false organization, uh, except for the BRICS Development Bank, which does have some useful purposes and makes loans to BRICS members. But what, what, is, uh, what is Ethiopia going to add to the, to the BRICS? It's also joining early next year when it comes to the BRICS Development Bank. They don't have any money to add. They have money, they'd like to take money out of it, but uh, the name of the game is you're supposed to contribute to the BRICS Development Bank. So to me, the BRICS is, um, is a, almost a figment of one's imagination. Anybody else from the panel? Yes, uh, and, and I think as well, it's important to, you know, come back to the point I made earlier, you know, nations act in their own national interest. Um, and, nations will continue to hedge as much as they possibly can because you don't want to necessarily cut off a relationship unless you absolutely have to. Uh, so there, there are aspects of having that relationship there that are useful for India. Um, you know, one could ask why is it that Australia has China as its number one trading partner and has the US as its number one security partner if if you, if you have to pick. So, so very rarely in the, in the international security environment are your choices completely binary. Uh, and and I, I, I would expect them to continue to act in their own national interests, and, which would include being able to, to hedge um, and engage with as many different countries as possible. Excellent, excellent discussion. Anybody else from the panel? Okay, is that answers your question, ma'am? Yes. Uh, just if I may, I, I think I have the right occasionally to chime in. So just for those, because we have also a general purpose force, might not be aware, BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, right? BRICS. Now, in addition to the countries uh, which uh, distinguished ambassadors mentioned about, so Iran and Argentina expressed the desire to join the organization. 
Okay, so um, the question is, again, to the point, why is becoming, at least economically, attractive to other countries? Why are they interested to join BRICS? So uh, another thing we've mentioned during our previous uh, discussions that maybe, maybe we should be a little bit concerned that uh, via uh, BRICS or Eurasian Customs Union, that's another organization led by China and Russia, at least these two countries are increasingly rapproaching each other. I'm talking about China and Russia. And the, during World War, one of the first uh, panels, I personally expressed a concern vis-a-vis -vis our national security. Maybe at some point, it would be certain uh, regional global ge geopolitical circumstances when China and Russia could even align militarily. Is it a fantasy is it, or is it a possibility? So there is a Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and there is a China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. A lot of similarities, as I said in my introduction, geopolitics is a chess game. We don't wanna, uh, whatever we're doing, we wanna make sure that our major adversaries are not approaching each other, but they're split. And then, guess what? Iran, increasingly Saudi Arabia, Argentina right here are joining the club as well. So if we have China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, it's a challenge. Can we fight Russia and China at the same time? As I said in our documentary with Army U Press, we just need to think about it, right? So what we need to do to split them? Just the two cents, as we say in the army, right? My two cents, if that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Finnamore, as you heard a minute ago. I'm, I'm the former Asia director for the Natural Resources Defense Council, an American nonprofit organization. And I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Ray had questioned about China's Belt and Road. In addition to the points we heard uh, from the panel, China, I would also say, as, as well as maybe increased skepticism or backfiring, their, uh, backlash, there's also some backfiring of one of the major purposes of the Belt and Road Initiative from China's perspective, which was to enhance its reputation. And it, is, it has come into some heavy fire for a number of reasons, in addition to the big debt question. And, and one of them is jobs. For many countries, China promised that these Belt and Road projects would bring a lot of jobs to the region, where in actual fact, it's mostly Chinese workers who are imported to do the work. Um, number two, in, in a number of cases, it's been discovered that China is using these Belt and Road projects to export uh, old technology, dirty technology, even in one case dismantling a factory that had been scheduled to be shut down in China, packaging it up and sending it to another country as part of the Belt and Road. Um, but thirdly, so much of what China has decided to, to export in terms of infrastructure, and it's not really the government, it's important to understand that um, <clears throat> most of these deals are done by private companies in China, not with minimal oversight by the government itself. What we're finding is, despite China's leadership in the world on renewable energy, it is far and away the world leader in such things as solar power, wind power, offshore wind, any kind of solar, electric vehicles, and so on. What it is often uh, exporting through Belt and Road is, is coal plants. And even coal plants in areas where China has, like I said, scheduled them for closure in its own country. And, and it's, it's, it's run into a lot of pushback, both within countries who no longer want to be part of the Belt and Road, and the, and the larger climate community who said, how does this comport both with China's own commitments to, to reach net zero climate emissions by 2060? And why isn't there an effort to work with the governments of the recipient countries and use the Belt and Road to help them 
reach their own climate commitments instead of going in the opposite direction. Thank you. Anybody would like to reply to, to the comment? Okay, excellent. And by the way, I'm, I'm just curious, what happened this 40 billion investment by, declared by China right after the co coalition withdrew from Afghanistan? Did they invest as a part of the and Belt Initiative or they did not? Ambassador Shin. I don't know as though we have the precise numbers. I, I think by and large they have, um, they have made that investment. Whether they've reached the, the total number or not, I don't know. Uh, you, so you get into some very difficult problems when you try to, to find uh, Chinese uh, investment numbers or Chinese aid numbers. Uh, right. They're really not very transparent about these things. Obviously. Yes, Ambassador. And, 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 and additionally, I think China wants to send its own workers to do these things, which is contrary to the interests of many of these countries uh, where they want to employ their own people. Excellent, excellent. So anybody else from this audience? Y yes, sir. Please, please, you are the next. Yes, the microphone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Bab, you will be the next. Thank you. No, 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 you are the, you are the next, please, okay. and he will be thank Dr. Bab. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank the panel for, uh, for uh, doing this today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Nate Moore. I'm a JMO instructor, H.E. Charlie. Recently uh, was a defense attache to Bangladesh and coming back. I appreciate uh, Ambassador Young's comment about, we keep on talking about China's, its relations, um, its lack of allies, um, which I think is a trend is true. I'd like to ask the whole panel, where do we see the trends on both Burma slash Myanmar? and Cambodia, and, and well, both Pakistan as well. And then sort of a bigger question that gets to, I think, a broader point is this, with this Belt and Road Initiative, with the, uh, with the long train that I've seen China have in that part of the world, is, uh, does China really need nation state allies? It has clients all throughout these countries. And they, they uh, whether it's the 5G network and Huawei and ZTE, I, I don't know that they actually need nation state allies to achieve their strategic ends. So this is a two part question. So where do we see trending uh, Myanmar, Pakistan and Cambodia in terms of Chinese? We can talk about an alliance, what that means, but uh, yeah, where, where is that trend? And then two, do they really need allies? Thank you. Excellent. Anybody to begin with from the panel? Ambassador Young? Well, well I, I'm probably repeating myself, but um, most of the neighbors of China are very suspicious of, of, of the PRC and its intentions in its assistance programs, which are oftentimes designed to uh, further their own corporation interests uh, more than uh, assisting the countries that, that they're working with. And you have thousands of years of tension uh, on the part of the neighbors of Russia, of China. When China is strong, it wants to expand its, its borders and uh, it uh, is not a very reliable partner. Anybody else from the panel? Colonel? Um, I'd just add, and, and it kind of ties back into the, the point you were making earlier, Dr. I. Um, I don't. I don't think that necessarily that uh, China and Russia were, were like the number one choice of all options for each other to to come together in a in a partnership with. Um, I was kind of sitting here searching for an analogy, and this is what I've just come up with on the spot. So if it lands flat, you know, let me know. Um, to me, it's kind of akin to you know when you're at the high school dance, and and people are starting to pair up, and and go off and, and get onto the dance floor. And like the numbers are starting to dwindle, and so you're like, well, I better grab someone before there's no one left. Um, does that work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so I, I think part of it is, 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 and, and you know, this comes back to this idea of, you know, what, what are we, are we looking for a more positive um, vision of the future or not? Um, the, the, the more, the, the tension is that the more we isolate countries, you know, the, the more desperate they're going to have to be in searching for someone else to, to create relationships with, because. You know, the, the reality in, in this current environment, when you think about the idea of collective security, uh, it, it's beyond the capacity of any single nation state to provide collective security for itself. I mean, even America, when you look into the, the, the depth of the national security strategy and, and the ideas behind integrated deterrence, 
allies and partners feature very heavily in that for a region. Um, and, and that is because we're kind of acknowledging that collective security has now moved beyond the nation state. Um, it hasn't been able to level up past that, you know, this idea that we would have, you know, the globe come together and look at collective security through that global lens. Um, but it certainly appears when you look at the, the, the significance of the trans-regional threats that we're facing now, um, you know, climate change and everything else that disperses out from that, that that's kind of potentially where we're going to. So I think the, the, the more we can have that more positive, collective, you know, inclusive vision of the future, the, the more opportunity we then have to start moving ourselves out of this competition steady state that we find ourselves in, which is a very uncomfortable one from a, from a global power balance situation to a more cooperative one. I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but I wanted to get that out of there. Okay. Is that answers the question? Okay, anybody else from the panel to add or reply? Good. Just, uh, if I may, another quick point to the same question that uh, to understand the India's position as a part of BRICS and anything else, and on the international arena as well, I think it would be very useful to listen to uh, Jai Shankar, Minister Jai Shankar's interviews. He is the uh, external uh, affairs minister of India. He made it very clear Whatever position India going to take is going to be very pragmatic, very neutral. It's going to be what is good for India. Is it good to join BRICS? They would join BRICS. That's what he made it very clear. Is it good to join any other associations or organizations? They will join it. So we used to have Pacific Command. Now we have Indo-Pay Command, right? So again, I just want to raise the hypothetical question, how much we can rely realistically, if it comes to the conflict. So he made it clear, this is our stance. Whatever is good for India, we're not going to be part of any international organizations because we are a huge, uh, we have a huge population as a, a second or whatever, the third economy globally. We don't have to be part of any organi organization. That's what he literally said. So, uh, yes, sir. Please, the other next. <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, it's my mistake. Dr. Babb, I promise you. I apologize. You no, will be the next. Let, let no, no, no. You, you let can. Let the student go first. Dr. Babb, you no, are let the, the next. Go first. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, my question's related, so it'll fit better here. Uh, Lieutenant Mark Peterson, uh, student here, uh, 13, Charlie. And I also spent about, I lived in Taiwan for about five years, so that, the Taiwan is near and dear to me. And my question is, Considering POTUS comments, this one previous about defense of Taiwan, <clears throat> and our real realization how dependent we are on coalitions and our allies, I wonder who we could count on in a conflict over Taiwan to side with us in all the elements of national power of dime. Who do you think we could and who do you think we could not in the Indo-Pacific region? Excellent question. Yes, Ambassador, please. Uh, it's a very good question and one that I've thought about a lot, uh, given my fondness for Taiwan. Uh, uh, truth in, in packaging, my father was a military advisor for Taiwan when I was a teenager, so I got an early exposure to the island, and it's an amazing success story of what you can do without any natural resources except your human capital. Um, I think President Biden was speaking perhaps a little bit carelessly, but of the real uh, policy interests of the United States in suggesting that we couldn't stand by if Taiwan was, was attacked. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, the Japanese, who with a lot of prodding from the Chinese have been suffering from war guilt way longer than they needed to have begun to both speak more forthrightly about their interests in the region and particularly their interest in not seeing Japan go down. Japan, as many of you know, was a colony of Japan for 50 years. And what struck me in my many tours in Taiwan and talking to a variety of people is that those who lived through that period were quite fond of Japan. 
uh, and uh, uh, the occupation created jobs, infrastructure, I mean the railroads and the dams and so forth that, that, that make that island thrive were often started by the Japanese during their tutelage. Uh, so um, I think it's good to see Japan stepping up. The Chinese would like to hold war guilt o over their heads for the rest of time, but uh, I think there's a statue of limitations and I think the Japanese have shown themselves to be uh, credible players in the region and, uh, and good friends of, of Taiwan's. Anybody else on the panel? Uh, Colonel, please. Oh, doctor. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting that in Taiwan, according to polling, more Taiwanese think that Japanese will come to their defense than think Americans will come to their defense. I think that we would uh, defend Taiwan. The caution that I have with uh, Japan is the way they've gotten used to doing things uh, with defense issues, it's such a touchy subject. Abe was able to uh, change their longstanding policy that they could not participate in collective self-defense, but they had to, they, had, they passed a specific law and the law is uh, made up of some very stringent requirements before they can legally uh, participate in collective self-defense, uh, which is what would be happening if they went to Taiwan. Uh, I hope that they would be able to overcome those uh, obstacles quickly enough to really uh, get there in time. On the other hand, the most southwestern part of Japan is a little island called Yonaguni, and on clear days you can see Taiwan uh, from Yonaguni. So it's, it's not a distant problem uh, for Japan, and more and more leaders have been talking about it in the last uh, several years about how important stability in Taiwan is to Japan's uh, safety and uh, ultimately its existence the way it exists now. So I think Japan would uh, participate. I, I certainly think uh, Australia uh, would help out. I just volunteered you. Nope, nope. <laughs> Can't take it back now. Uh, <clears throat> I think there would be uh, there would be a, an outpouring from the the world, frankly, to uh, help Taiwan if they were actually invaded. And uh, uh, of course, they have that uh, the what some people think of as this semiconductor shield. Uh, Ninety percent of the highest grade semiconductors are made in Taiwan uh, and 60% of the overall market is held by Taiwan. Uh, so uh, even China, uh, who wants the island for their prestige, for nationalist reason, regions, they, they would hesitate, I think, to disrupt such an important commodity in the world. Colonel? So I, I don't I don't think it's in any nation's interest in the region, and and I would include you know, China in that as well to see the um, use of force to resolve territorial disputes normalised. Um, certainly, as they cast as you cast an eye over to Europe, um, you know there's some there's some useful lessons that can be drawn out of that. Um, as far as like would Australia participate? Well, I would leave that decision to the government of the day, um, but. I, th I think the context matters as well, though. So uh, as, you, as you look at the concept of strategic ambiguity, um, I think it's tempting to look at that as, as being kind of solely focused on, on China or P the PRC as the audience, um, but, but it's not. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a dual-focused approach. So on the one hand, it's, it's leaving China or the PRC um, with, with the question of, if we do something, we don't really know what's going to happen, but it's also messaging to the Republic of China, um, or ta Taiwan, uh, to, to kind of dissuade them from doing something that would disrupt the status quo as well, like declaring independence formally from, from China itself. Um, so 
as I said, the, the, the context behind why conflict emerged between China and Taiwan is, is very, very important. Um, and I think that would be a driver behind, you know, which countries would or would not participate in, in such an event. Excellent. Anybody else from the panel? Okay. Is that answers the question? Good to go. Uh, Dr. Babb, you are the next, please. Yep, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. All right. Anybody else? Got one question. Yes, sir. Uh, my, my name is Major Jason Napier. I'm with the Field of Force Integration Directorate. And uh, my question is, uh, you know, do for, it's for any of you, uh, but do you believe uh, that the West is caught in a Thucydides trap? And what that is is, um, you know, do the two entities just by nature, because they view themselves as enemies, um, do they, do they you know, commit themselves to, you know, a potential conflict in the future? So that's between the West and China. And, and if you do believe so, you know, what is our, our route outside, our route away from that? Excellent. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. The easiest answer would be a different government in Beijing, but that's, <laughs> that's hard to imagine, uh, especially because uh, Emperor Xi has, I mean, uh, President Xi has uh, declared himself president for life. Because he'd like to solve Taiwan within his lifetime, I hope he lives a long time. But uh, more realistically, I think uh, Ukraine should be a salutary uh, warning to people who covet the territory of their neighbors because uh, I think uh, the uh, Ukrainians, and I'm very impressed by them, have shown a much bigger country that it's not so easy. And I would think that the lesson for China is that Taiwan is uh, several factors more complicated and uh, they should think long and hard about that. Anybody else from the panel? Ambassador? Yeah, I, I'm not a, a China expert, but that doesn't stop me on talking about it. Um, <laughs> I would simply suggest that um, as you look at what is going on domestically in China today with the, some of the issues that are cropping up that were not really thoroughly predicted in many cases um, just a couple of years ago, the demographic issue was well known. That was fairly predictable, and it's obviously a very serious issue for China. But some of the uh, the issues involving uh, construction and investment in uh, property and the uh, the unemployment rate for youth uh, coming out of uh, universities, etc. I, I don't recall having heard much about that a year or two ago, um, and it seems to me that this may cause. China to sort of draw back a bit and rethink you know, where it goes from here, that it's been very assertive in, in recent years. But I wonder, uh, and I, I just pose this more as a question than, a, than an answer, um, I wonder if it isn't going to sort of rethink where it sits in the world and what it really has the capacity to do, which would play into your question. If, if, they, are bec if, if they become somewhat less assertive, then I think there's less of a prospect of this trap being sprung. Quinnell, please. Um, so I'll, I'll refrain from offering, just restating Graham Allison's um, points from his book uh, as, as we consider the Thucydides trap analogy. Um, I, I think as, as we look at that global security environment and we look at the, the, the two major players as we think about great power competition, you know, so. Um, U.S. and China, right? Um, I think the U.S. And, and, and a lot of the world would agree the U.S. is, is the big player. They are, you know, in, in the terms of the book, the, 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 the declining power, if you will. Um, but it, it's really about how you want to prioritise where, where you want to apportion your efforts. So there are things that we are in competition with China on, but there are also things that we, we really need to cooperate with China on. Um, and, and yes, a, a, di a different government in China would would probably make life a little bit easier when it comes to that choice. Um, but I think what we've seen over the many thousands of years of Chinese history is they don't do government transitions very well at all. Um, and, and so, we, you know, we, 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 we have the people that we have. Um, we don't control whether or not China becomes uh, more aggressive or less aggressive in the global scale. We only can control our own actions. Um, and I think as you look at the transition between the, the previous administration and the current administration and their approach to the engagement with China, 
um, initially in, in, in the uh, interim national st strategic security guidance, there was probably a lot more continuity than change from, from, the, uh, from the Trump administration's approach. Um, but then as you look at the, the NSS itself, the, the most recent NSS, um, I think you start to see a lot more um, change starting to come about. There's, there's a lot more conciliatory language in there. Um, there's a lot more uh, language that talks about the areas where we could cooperate with China into the future. Um, and I think what it comes down to is how we're now prioritizing essentially the, the two threat vectors to the United States national interests being malign uh, authoritarian actors, states, and, and the trans-regional problems. Um, you know, the document's very clear that those trans-regional problems are beyond the capacity of any one nation to solve alone. Um, so the decision then has to be made, how do we prioritize these? If we want to prioritize um, the threat of nation states, then we're going to continue to push, I think, towards a, uh, a more higher end of the conflict, uh, uh, competition spectrum, hedging ourselves towards conflict. Um, if we want to prioritise those trans-regional threats, I mean, climate change being a good example, um, then there's potentially scope for us to de-escalate that and, and, and find ourselves in a more cooperative environment. Hope that... Excellent, yeah. excellent. Anybody else? Is, is anybody else on the panel, please? Well, I, yes. We, we just do, we tend to do a lot of straight line uh, progression analysis. You know, this is the way uh, in the... In the uh, 70s up until the late uh, 70s, early 80s, it, it was Japan. You know, Japan is, uh, or I'm sorry, in, into the 80s, into the early 90s. Japan is growing exponentially. Oh, they're going to bypass us as the world's richest nation. What are we going to do? And then they had a problem, and uh, that was no longer a problem, <coughs> uh, no longer a threat to us. Now, China, uh, they're going to surpass us. What are we going to do? And then all of a sudden, with the bad news out of uh, China, the headlines I've seen just in the last couple of weeks are, oh, well, never mind. They're not doing all that, they're not doing all that well. But they're still dangerous. They're still dangerous. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that, that what we look on as a threat can change uh, pretty suddenly. And what it looks like today doesn't mean that's the way it's going to look in six months or uh, a few years. So I don't think that, there is, uh, that, that we inevitably will have to fight China. In uh, the response to COVID, Xi Jinping was able to put in these draconian policies, and, and <coughs> uh, but more and more people started to uh, protest. And all of the, or a lot of the commentary in the Western press was, well, nobody, he, he surrounded himself with yes men. So there, there's really nobody who can tell him that he's wrong, so these people are just going to suffer. And then all of a sudden he said, okay, it's over. Go back to, nor to, to regular life. Uh, so with these economic problems that they're having now, if that can penetrate, I mean, they do have now in China the bad emperor problem. He is surrounded by yes men. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the bad emperor problem during the imperial uh, dynasties, uh, imperial dynasties were always overthrown by groups coming from other parts of the country and they're fighting uh, against imperial troops. The imperial troops aren't allowed to tell the emperor uh, that they've lost, so they keep reporting these glorious victories. And the, the smarter emperors realize that as these glorious victories got closer and closer to the capital, you know, he might eventually have a problem. Uh, <coughs> So she was able to do that with uh, COVID. Is he going to be able to do it with the other many problems that are uh, popping up in China right now? Uh, we'll have to see, but we won't necessarily be fighting them. Excellent. Yes, Ambassador, please. I, very good points. I, I'd also add that demographically, China is in a real problem. Uh, I remember the one child policy being, you know, Dung's answer to population growth. Unfortunately, it came out about the same time as uh, uh, sonograms. And given the preference for boys over girls, you now have too many young men chasing after too few brides. So, you know, it's, it's not a very uh, attractive uh, uh, aspect of, of central planning. 
and uh, China is going to be living with that for a long time. And now their population growth is shrinking too. So um, that can make them dangerous and adventurous, uh, which is why really, and I, when I give talks with a map of China behind me, I say, show me a neighbor of China that really is fond of them and wants to, to you know, be their friends. Because the Chinese, and we're going back thousands of years, uh, have that old expression, what's mine is mine, what's yours is negotiable. And uh, it doesn't make for, for good friendships. Anybody else from the distinguished panel? Is that answers your question, sir? Thank you for the great question, which encouraged a lot of uh, you know, in, uh, intellectual analysis here and information. So I, I, I was feeling like the, this uh, intellectual activity back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> that was great. Um, you have you are the next. Your question or comment? Joe Donald, I'm on the faculty here. Dr. Hunter Chester, I'm going to take advantage of you being here. If um, Vladimir Putin was to lose office, which would probably right. be coincidental to losing his life, Feet first, and a, a new government or some uh, some different government was in Russia, how do you see it? Would there be a resolution of the Kuril Island dispute with Japan and Russia, and, and how would you see that playing out? All right. All right. Well, you know, the problem uh, with with uh, Russia now is that there is no uh, system for a peaceful transfer of power. So we have absolutely no idea, and uh, nobody in Russia really has any idea about who would who would survive the knife fight after uh, Putin is gone. Uh, so uh, there is a significant chance that the next person would just be a uh, in the in the job that I'm in now. I have written uh, about Russia, but I'm not a Russia specialist. But I'll go ahead and give. <laughs> Uh, my opinion. It's it's uh, uh, it's a thugocracy. It's it's run by uh, criminals, and uh, criminals are likely to. Uh, it's likely that a criminal would replace uh, Putin because that's about all they have right now. Uh, the Kuril uh, Islands uh, in leadership positions. Kuril Islands, for those that, of you that don't know, were taken over by the Russians at the end of World War II. They're still claimed by uh, Russia, but Japan says that they were the, the islands that are classified as Kuril and occupied by Russian really shouldn't have been included, and they've been trying for 70 years to get them back from uh, Russia and uh, without uh, any success at all. So they would uh, like for that to happen. On the other hand, the, the Japanese that were displaced from the Kuriles these days have, uh, most of them have passed away. So there, uh, there, there may be a lessening of that desire, uh, though uh, I, I'm sure it will remain a cherished wish of any given uh, Japanese government. But I don't, I don't see much chance of a successful resolution of that uh, anytime soon. Would, but would I may Japan be doing that straight line projection that I just told you we shouldn't do. Would, would Japan press their claim? Uh, if given the chance, certainly. All right, by the same token, we can ask a question if Eastern Prussia, you know, the status of Eastern Prussia could change, which is used to be Königsberg, uh, part of Germany before, before World War II, and is it going to change if there is a change of government in Russia? Uh, I, I've researched Russia, Eurasia for the last 100 years, and it's part of my major expertise. I was that. <laughs> I am, yeah, not as old as almost there, <laughs> but I can tell you it's unlikely, regardless of the change of the government in Russia, these changes are not going likely to occur. But you never know. You know, there is no guarantees. So Russia likes invading other countries, as we know. And uh, since they invaded, they never want to give away. <laughs> so uh, I think this is a good time 
to stop here. It's almost time to wrap up the session, right? Um, now, um, so next slide, please. These are some of our capabilities and active partners across the country and globally. Um, okay, I will give you a second to look through it. So we're going to have the director of the Asia Institute of the Wilson uh, Center for International Studies in Washington, D.C. for the next panel. We're going to continue per guidance from our leadership on indo -PECOM. So that's why we are lining up next scholars for our next panels. So we'll add here the Wilson Center's uh, logo and website as well. Next slide, please. So the last slide is the links to Castle website. We have quite a robust website. We've been doing these particular panels for many years. So all the videos, all the related publications, the digital library, everything on this website in one place. So during the next several days, within one week, uh, the video uh, and related uh, articles, uh, etc., information going to be uh, posted here. The video is going to be on CASO YouTube channel, CJC YouTube channel as well. Uh, so we have that, uh, that list of all the videos which we, uh, 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 for the panels for the many years. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, indo pecom Iran, it's a major regional and global geopolitical issues. So, and this is of course the Facebook page. At this point, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank, uh, sir, would you like to have the final, rem okay. So, I would like to thank our panel for sharing their great and very insightful expertise and analysis with us. We look forward to seeing you in early November. Thank you very much.